Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is day nine of L2 construction series. Uh, once again, I would like, uh, together with uh, Hong Kit, would like to uh, express our gratitude to all our audience here today uh, for supporting uh, the L2 construction series. Now, your participation and support encourages us to uh, proceed uh, further with our series, and hopefully, uh, this uh, series will continue uh, even after the MCO is lifted. Now, uh, today's topic is uh, so what uh, happens after MCO? Now, we have a special guest today uh, who doesn't need any further introduction. Now, she was a very experienced uh, construction lawyer and now uh, an arbitrator, adjudicator, and a mediator. Um, and those who are involved in the construction industry uh, would have, at some point in time, or would have known um, Tan Sui Yim herself. Uh, she is a very um, well-known uh, practitioner uh, in the construction field. Now, uh, without further ado, I now pass the mic to uh, Sui Yim uh, to firstly introduce uh, uh, herself uh, briefly to all the audience and then to proceed with her presentation uh, for the day. Over to you, Swim. Thank you very much, Wailun. Thank you very much, Honkit. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And welcome to your daily dose of L2. Um, it's a great, uh, great thing that you guys are doing. So uh, it's I look at the uh, number of people out there and there's many of you who are old friends from uh, many years ago. And that's what happens when you are in the industry for over 30 years. So I've been asked to just uh, give a little bit of intro introduction as to you know, where I came from and how did I spend this last 30 years at work? I started life um, actually as a banking lawyer and this was during the late 1980s um, financial crisis during the recession. And I found that as a newly qualified lawyer, I was spending every day going to court, making somebody bankrupt, selling off somebody pieces of somebody's land, um, taking judgment against borrowers. And it was a quite a depressing situation. And luckily I fell into construction really quite by accident. And I found that I absolutely loved it. A lot of it is because you drive around town in any city or, um, and, and you look at things and say, that's my project, I worked on this, and you know some inside stories about it. Uh, I went on to work in-house in a large public listed company. At that point in time, that company was not as big as it is today, and I was the first external lawyer. And I was very, very fortunate to be able to work on some amazing projects, such as the first independent power plants, to work on a project in South Africa and to have opportunities such as to meet Nelson Mandela in person. But after three years there, I then went back into practice, but not really because I actually ended up being seconded out to the KL International Airport project. And there, in that project, I was actually part of a, a team for, of overseas lawyers. Um, those days, they were called Masons, and they were the number one construction law firm in the world those days, and today, you know them as Pinson Masons. So it gave me an, an amazing um, opportunity to work on a huge national project, and I really felt at that young age that I was nation building with um, the rest of the teams. Whilst on that project, I also worked on the Link Kadua, the Malaysia-Singapore Second Crossing, on the elite highway that links uh, NKVE to uh, KLIA, um, and on several other projects. So very, very fortunate to have been working on these amazing big projects. I went on in 1995 to become a, a, a junior partner in a law firm and to build a construction department. I did a very good job because I built that department of one, that's myself. And during that time, I managed to, uh, I ended up, not I managed to, but I ended up uh, acting and being the lawyer for many, uh, the majority of the, the foreign contractors in, in Malaysia, uh, from Germans to Australians to um, the Brits, you know, all, everybody and anybody. Unfortunately, in 1997, the Asian financial crisis occurred and everybody left, so I was left without any clients. So I had to reinvent myself. 
by the time 1999 came, um, the effects of the Asian financial crisis had been uh, uh, felt very widely, including by myself. I took a 40% pay cut. And at that point in time, I thought, well, I'm going to go it alone. So in 1999, I started my law firm at Tan Sui Yim and Company. 20 years on, um, that law firm, I have already exited. I'm, I was a consultant in the law firm from 2016. And last year, I have exited the firm and I am now full-time um, as an independent arbitrator, adjudicator, a mediator, third-party neutral. The firm still carries my name, but Siva runs that firm as Tan Sui Yim, Siva and Partners. So here I am today um, dealing with disputes in construction. So because I've had 30 years and because I've been through three recessions and this is being my fourth and because I have collected so many gray hairs um, in that time and seen so many different things, uh, L2 is it when I come and uh, say a few words. So I said, yes, of course. And I thought to myself, what am I going to talk about? So today is Day nine of L2, but more importantly, we're looking forward to possibly the MCO being lifted in seven days time. That virtual background you see in, front, um, in, in, in my photo is actually a construction site that I look out on. Yes, I live in Bangsa and this is the construction site that I face. There are 12 tower cranes there and I've watched that construction site get really noisy, get really dusty, be really um, uh, quite irritated by it, but now I've got it go completely silent. All the tower cranes are eerily quiet, and at night it is actually eerily dark. But we look forward to those tower cranes whirring again and people being very, very busy. But, you know, as we think forward to how we're going to go back to life after the MCO, um, I think that we really have to think about it very holistically. Holistically is not a, a religious term, it's just thinking about it in the general way and looking at things from very different aspects. I don't think that you can just turn on the tap and everything goes back to normal. To the next slide, slide please. So the first thing we have to do is actually go back and start work. Next slide, please. You have to remop, right? I look at this big construction site and think to myself, the ability to remop of that is massive. There's so many things that one has to deal with. Are you able to start immediately? That's something that you've got to think about. That's something you really got to plan ahead for. I would dare say that many people are not able to start immediately. You've got supply chain disruptions. Um, are your workers available? Um, you are worried about time and money consequences. And also the other thing to think about, of course, is actually protecting your performance bond. Because as much as you're worried about EOT and loss expenses and delays, by the same token, your performance bond is sitting out there as an on-demand bond and you're worried about it. Even when you do go back, I mean, I think that you have to think about the fact that you may not be able to work in the same manner. I don't believe that uh, just because the MCO is lifted that we're going to go back to life as we know it. Uh, most likely you're going to be imposed with social distancing and on a construction site I think that really translates into disruption of your work. So I do believe that you're going to have to have discussions as to how to plan going forward on a project-wide basis. In other words, it's not about you at home listening to this webinar and thinking about how can you make your claims but you need to be talking to the entire project project managers should be reaching out to you, you should be reaching out to your supply chain and so on and so forth. Slide, please. When you go back to work, what is it you've got to be thinking about? Well, a lot of people will say that I just go back to work. If it's the same work, nothing has changed, the same rates will apply. But you and I know the same work done over a longer period of time with the same rates being paid means to say that there's insufficient recovery for any contractor or subcontractor. VOs, I think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that life is not going to be back as normal. Therefore, there's going to be all sorts of variations. 
you may have additional work that has come about because of the suspension. You know, your starter bars have had to be protected. You've had to do some temporary shoring to, to uh, ensure safety. But when we go, do go back, apart from these uh, immediate things, we may be thinking about having to deal with omissions where projects have to be slightly changed. Designs maybe have, to, maybe have to be changed because of a supply chain disruption. You may find that certain parts may be, uh, of the project may be accelerated, certain parts may be suspended, all to cater for many, many different reasons. Everything from the economy and the supply and demand to supply chain disruptions to specific issues. For example, you may have had um, um, a group of workers who are down with COVID-19 themselves. These are all the sort of things that we have to think about, and these will result in variations. Slide, please. With variations, of course, I mean, um, and with the MCO, of course, everybody has been talking about claiming EOT. All of you have been well advised, not just by L2 and their guest speakers, but also through other webinars and everything, and so many uh, publications out there. <clears throat> and yes, it's correct. Make those claims follow the contract. And you also have heard about the fact that quite often you can get, in this example of force majeure clauses, you can get extension of time, you can get relief from LAD, but you may not get lost expenses. Now, one thing I've not really heard uh, spoken about is that in some contracts, there is also this business about uh, a provision uh, to enable termination by either party when the force majeure, has force majeure event has continued for a fixed period. It's not in every contract. You need to go out there and have a look at your contract and um, get your advisors to look into that. Because as an example, it may be that the contract is terminated either by you or not by you, by your main contractor, by your employer. Slide, please. Of course, foremost in everybody's mind is money, how to survive. Slide, please. So how do you survive? Well, I would think, I've been thinking about that because there's no easy answer and everybody is in this uh, same problem. So what are the things that we can do to just help the situation and mitigate the situation? Let's start off with your pre-MCO work. A lot of work was done prior to the 18th of March. Are your claims up to date? Are your VOs all properly documented and claimed? Are all your loss and expense claims already made? Have you started preparing your final account? Now, all this actually are not affected by the MCO. In fact, the MCO has given you some downtime to prepare all these claims and get yourself fully up to date. Absolutely up to date and in a position where your claims can be quickly processed. Slide, please. Post MCO. Of course, the same thing still applies. Your documentation, following your contract provisions, making your submissions on time. But this is when you really have to up your game. You really have to be timely. You have to be accurate. You have to follow the contract. You want to actually reduce the amount of disputes. You reduce the possibility of any of your claims getting kicked back for insufficient documentation, insufficient details, all that kind of procedural issues. If you can get rid of that, at least you make it easier. You just get that one step closer to having your claims processed. I talked about VOs earlier on, and I've no doubt that uh, there will be many VOs that are not agreed, perhaps not even properly instructed. What do you do if you are a contractor? Well, you have to maintain your stand and put in your documentation, maintaining that it is a VO and keep claiming and, and hold your ground. If you are a um, contract administrator and let's say the developer, then you really do have to recognize that VOs are VOs and there's no way around it. My point is that up your game, comply with the contract and be very, very quick. Slide, please. Loss expense claims, same thing. I mean, you've heard many of the, the lawyers, you've heard a lot of people giving advice. Comply with your contract, listen to the advice, consult with the advisors, and we will keep moving on and making those claims. Slide, please. Why is it that I'm talking about this kind of thing? Why is it I'm talking about being quick? Why am I talking about being complete with your documentation and your claims? Because the faster you get those claims in, the quicker the due date for payment comes about. 
Now you can't really complain if some payment is not yet due. How do you change something that is not yet due? And how do you make something due? By actually making the application process, following the contract and getting that due date for payment on your doorstep as quickly as possible. Slide please. As much as you're doing all this, we are in a construction industry whereby the supply chain is a very, very long one. Your sub subcontractors, your sub 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 subcontractors, and we hear stories about how that goes down, you know, down to 22 levels sometimes. So as much as you're making these claims and you're thinking about making the claims upwards, think about all the claims that are being made against you from below. You are going to be dealing with up and down and the side. You're going to be playing that dancing that dance, you know, fix the light bulb, pet the dog, fix the light bulb, pet the dog. So you're going to be very, very busy. So my point is that you're going to have to have eyes behind you, on top of you, at the side of you. You've got to be thinking about the whole thing in a very holistic manner. Slide, please. I know this has been said to you before, and I'm just going to touch on it again very quickly. Risk allocation. Risk allocation is a matter of contract. And this is why, for example, when you have heard the webinars and seen the advice on uh, force majeure cl uh, clauses, this is considered a neutral event, whereby it's not the fault of either party. And therefore, the way the con most contracts will allocate the risk on that is to share it. And this is why you tend to see force majeure clauses with ability for contractors to claim for time, but not necessarily for loss and expenses. This is compared as compared to fault-driven uh, risk. What you see on the slide there is just something that comes from any stock standards textbook, and these are the type of risk allocations. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to go back to your contract to see where the risk allocation is. And why do I speak to risk allocation? Because at the, day, at the end of the day, that is what's going to drive your contractual and legal entitlements. Next slide, please. Ultimately, all these claims that you make perfectly, beautifully, on time, in detail, and in full compliance with the contract, you are probably going to have to chase those claims as well. Obviously, the first and best route would be one of amicable settlement. A quote from World War II, jaw, jaw is better than war, war. So fighting doesn't necessarily give you the result that you're looking for in the time frame that you're looking for. However, an amicable settlement may do so. I'll come back to that in a while. What's your next thing? Everybody talks about SIPA. Sure, I agree with you. SIPA is a great tool for us to have. But do remember a few things, yeah? that SIPA is only for claims that are related to money and for work done under the contract. So for example, you're claiming something, an, a, an extension of time under force majeure for which there is no provision in the contract for loss and expenses. You make the claim for loss and expenses and you claim it under SIPA. It's not a contractual claim. You come to me as an adjudicator, my jurisdiction over that will be challenged and most likely it will be successful. So these are the sort of nuances that you've got to have to think about. What's the other possibility? Court, of course. And we've got some great construction judges at this point in time that will allow you for making contracts at law and in, um, excuse me, make claims for contract under the contract and at law. But as we all know, a lot of construction contracts and subcontracts and supply contracts will have an arbitration clause. You are also likely to be met with a stay application and under our current arbitration, that stay application will almost like almost certainly succeed. So you may actually be um, blocked there. Even if there is no arbitration clause and you go to court, you may end up in a court and next arbitration because the courts have limited time. And there is a number of us at the moment who are acting as arbitrators on behalf of the court, effectively looking after and dealing with their cases which the court doesn't have time for. Next slide, please. Arbitration is your go-to and it's your norm. Sure, 
and arbitration can actually deal with all your claims that you have. But arbitration also does take time and money. Um, one of the considerations you can have is actually that most contracts will have a normal arbitration clause. In other words, uh, it is one that uh, is a full-blown arbitration. Perhaps parties can actually agree ad hoc to adopt fast-track arbitration rules. And that can shorten the time and confine the whole um, arbitration process to a shorter, more concise manner as possible. One thing I do want to talk about is mediation because I do see that um, there's a great possibility that mediation is going to be used more and more and that mediation is going to be perhaps one of the more successful uh, ways to achieve a reasonable outcome. Because mediation is really a negotiated settlement and it can uh, reach um, settlements that are regardless of the contract provisions. Why? Because it is actually looking at the needs and of the parties as opposed to purely only on the contract. Now, you may ask why mediation and if, if I haven't been able to settle it in uh, over a te tare or in the karaoke bar, how will mediation help? Well, it does help because effectively it is like a marriage guidance counselor and I don't mean here speaking your Doraemon voice, but what I mean is that very often we all get into a conflict situation and you listen to what's going on, but you don't actually hear what's being said. And this is where a mediator and a mediation process can help you. Again, go talk to your advisors and your lawyers about that. All these things that we're talking about and all these possibilities will be happening at every level of contract, every level of subcontract, regardless of whether it is a full-blown, you know, multi-volume, a contract document, or a simple one-pager purchase order. These are all things that are going to be happening. These are all things that we're all going to have to think about. All I'm saying to you is that do bear in mind that it's not a one-size-fits-all. For every different forum, there are different considerations. Slide, please. We all exist in the ecosystem including myself as an arbitrator adjudicator. We're all part of this ecosystem. And for any one project, you die, I die. Yeah, a developer who doesn't get his contractor to complete, he, he's got a problem. A main contractor who doesn't uh, feed his subcontractor cannot do the work. You die, everybody dies. But in this case, nobody can die. We cannot allow people to die. We cannot allow the project to die. So what do we have to do? At the end of the day, we just got to be realistic. You know, this is the way it is. And um, we've got to try and find some win-win solutions. And I use an example from the 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis. And it, this was a KLIA project. For the longest time, the US dollar had been $1 to 2 ringgit 50. People were borrowing in US dollar because the interest rates were much lower than borrowing in ringgit. But what happened, of course, was that the moment the um, Asian financial crisis hit, 250 suddenly became something like seven ringgit before it was pegged, finally pegged at 380. On KLIA project, obviously, there was a lot of imported goods and imported systems. And it was killing everybody. So you start looking at the contract and see whether there are ways to claim. Yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. What really happened in the end was that there were a lot of negotiated deals that were cut and agreed. And in that situation, a lot of those deals were to share the pain. And so nobody actually took the whole pain. Nobody actually won everything. And you look at our project, our airport now, it's 20 years on and it's still a fantastic airport because it was completed and it was completed well because there was a way out that did not kill people. You know, and this is going to happen in throughout the whole industry supply chain, the domestic supply chain. And in today's case, that supply chain, even if it's domestic, involves uh, international supply chains. And we're all in this together, the whole world. In terms of legislative relief, I don't really see anything specific here in Malaysia. I mean, there are things, for example, like in Singapore, they're talking about deferring uh, claims being made for a certain period of time. 
Now in Malaysia, the closest thing I can think about is uh, under the Companies Act. Again, if I go back to 1997, uh, there was this thing called Section 176 of the Companies Act, whereby there was a ring fencing around companies to stop creditors coming against you and uh, give you time to restructure. I believe that there is something similar under the New Companies Act. Again, something that you might want to think about uh, if you have to. Slide, please. Looking to the future now, I mean, what can we do? I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can only work on what I've seen in the past three recessions and uh, granted that this recession is, is not the same as the others, but every recession is new. Immediate future, of course, you're going to make your claims and you're going to chase your claims. But also recognize the fact that you're probably going to end up with what is effectively a new contract, a change contract. Even if the contract terms are not completely changed, I think you are definitely going to see um, a different program. You're going to see a different way of doing things. I think that you have to be alert and alive to these changes and be able to handle them and deal with them. And you know, a lot of this dealing with it is probably going to be part and parcel of how the survival, how survival uh, it comes about. In the midterm, when you, you get over this immediate hump and you start looking for new contracts, perhaps it's time to start thinking about negotiating your contract terms, actually reading them, considering them, doing a risk analysis of them, and actually upping your game and having strong contract administration. Again, you've heard many webinars about that. In a much longer term, and I think that this is really in a much longer term, perhaps as an industry, we can think about different types of contracts, the partnering type contracts, the pain gain type contracts. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in London for the Olympics, for example, they use uh, pain gain, the partnering type contracts, and actually they reduce, um, reduce a lot of disputes. In Hong Kong nowadays, for example, the larger government projects, they're using the new engineering contract, NEC, which is a form of uh, pain gain type contracts. And perhaps it's something we can start thinking about for Malaysia, but that really will be in the longer term. Slide, please. I believe that at the end of the day, communication is very important. So we're all sitting in our individual homes. Um, in my case, sitting at a home and looking at 12 tower cranes, they're absolutely silent. Uh, but we are able to connect. Look at this. We've got 617 participants on this. We're all talking to each other. We're all listening to each other. And I think that at the end of the day, by doing so, we are actually sharing our fears, our hopes, our concerns with each other, and we're talking it out. We're, in fact, counselling each other. And I think that with the case of your entire supply chain of your company, your subcontractors, your suppliers, uh, even the consultants and your developers, um, in other words, on top and below you, you're actually having to be talking. You're having to be talking to your bankers as well because everybody's afraid. And when you're afraid and you don't hear anything, you assume the worst. So communication, I think, is going to be very, very important. Slide, please. And communication is going to be complex because in any, any one project, I mean, this is just one example of a project. Look at the number of people involved there. Look at the number of uh, parties and the different elements that are involved there. And everybody is part and parcel of this whole ecosystem. Everybody needs to actually be a part of the recovery and how to deal with this. And the only way you can do this is by reaching out and actually working together. I don't see any other way. And I, I've seen this happen in the previous uh, recessions as well. Slide, please. So I just give you some thoughts here. You know, I'm not a crystal ball gazer. Um, if anything, I'm a historian. I'm actually drawing on the experiences of three previous recessions and drawing on uh, my gray hairs. There is no magic solution. There's no magic wand. So all I think that we can do is to work as a community and try and get over this and try and help everybody along. There are no winners. And I think that what we're trying to do is actually to minimize the number of losers. So everybody, good luck and do the best you can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sui. As always, uh, listening to you is like drinking from the fountain of wisdom. <laughs> Before today, uh, our discussions were mainly related to individual benefits and drawbacks. 
such as the reservation of rights and preparation uh, of claims for EOT and uh, loss and expense. Today, you bring uh, us to looking at the same issue, but from a macro perspective. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have this question. The MCO has caused suspension to most of the construction projects and brought many contractual and legal complications uh, to the parties. Uh, there will be endless disputes on both time and cost. The usual way is to call the lawyers and claim consultants in and initiate claims. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about an uh, ecosystem, which is a network of entities, uh, including employers, uh, many contractors, subcontractors, consultants, suppliers, uh, even bankers, and so on, who are all involved in the sustainability of the construction industry through both competition and uh, cooperation. Yes. Uh, yeah. The idea is that uh, each, uh, each entity in the ecosystem affects and also is affected by the others. Yes. So uh, to ensure the continuous sustainability of the ecosystem in these challenging times, instead of uh, uh, resorting to legal actions, which would be damaging to relationship and eating up enormous amount of money, time, and also talent, amicable settlements should be the preferred mode of uh, dispute resol resolution. Uh, as we all know, uh, settlement does not limit to how much to pay and when to pay. It can also have future collaborations uh, be, uh, between the parties to be included as part of the settlement. Uh, this does not only preserve the relationship, but also promote uh, sustainability uh, to the ecosystem. Uh, however, uh, Sui, do you think the stakeholders are mature enough or have the proper understanding about settlement to take this path? And do you have any advice for the contractors? Are they mature? Of course, like if in every society, you've got the mature ones, you've got the immature ones, you've got the old souls, you've got the young souls, you've got the hot heads, and you've got the calm voices. It's true of every life. So what we have to do basically is actually make sure that there is information out there and resources out there to assist people to make their claims and to prepare themselves for such settlements. In other words, you can buy the maturity for somebody else. You can buy the advice from somebody else. I mean, the one thing I would say about settlements is that you don't go in there just brandishing, um, shouting to say that I, I'm, I'm desperate, I'm desperate, give me some money, give me some money, I can't deal with this anymore. I mean, that's not really a way to go into settlement. We're talking about going in in a mature way. In other words, for example, you've got claims you have got to actually produce your claims in accordance with the contract and as if you're going to, let's say, an arbitration. Why do I say that if you're going to go to settlement? You may say, chin chai, chin chai, I just put together a couple of numbers that's good enough. Well, no, because the more prepared you are, the more able you are to negotiate a settlement. It also means to say that on the other side, you're not just cost trading a number. You're actually dealing with what are the issues that you can narrow? What are the issues you can't narrow? Where is it that you can seek compromise? So it is not just I bang, a, bang my table and say, I want 1 million, and you bang the table and say, oh, no, 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 you're only entitled to 100,000. So it's, that doesn't get you anywhere. So the maturity comes actually from the, uh, from the understanding that you've got to make your claims. And in order to make your claims and in order to, to do this properly, actually, you also need advisors. Very often you do. So I, I believe that it can, it, that can be achieved. One other thing I was going to say also is that with regard to settlements, remember that any settlement that comes about, a company that is going to make some payment by way of settlement has to be able to withstand internal audit. So if I come and bang my table, the table and say, I want a million and you agree to give me 100,000, I do believe that you're going to have to have um, your internal audit trail to justify the 100,000. How do you do that? You have to have documentation to do that and you actually go at the end of the day back to what were the contractual requirements? What is that contractual entitlement? How is that being compromised or settled in a different way and why? And there must be a trail. So that's why I think that it's possible to do it. Are they mature enough? If you're not mature enough or you think you're not mature enough, buy that maturity in. <laughs> there must be a way out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, sweet. Then how about uh, SIPA? Does it still have a place uh, in this time uh, as it is supposed to be the pay-first, argue-later solution to cash flow? 
Of course, Ajin Sipa will always have a role to play, but as I said earlier on, Sipa has got, it, it, it's, in a way, it's limited um, by the ambit of the statute. But I think that in today's scenario, you have to also consider more carefully than before. If you go to SIPA, your question is that, can your decision, that lovely pieces of paper that an adjudicator like myself writes, with all those words and the numbers that you like, can that be converted into ringgit and cent? So if that decision is going to, for example, be enforced against the paying party and that sends them to liquidation, you're not going to get any money. So why do you go down this route of SIPA? So these are the sort of things that, I mean, I think we've got to think in a wider, wider sense. Right. That's it. How, how do you see your thoughts uh, being implemented given the cash flow crisis experience uh, by everyone? For example, a main contractor may uh, have reached a repayment proposal with the employer, but then could not reach uh, amicable settlements with his subcontractors. And in this situation, the main contractor would be out of business before long. I cannot rule that out. I mean, the things that I talk about are thoughts and things that we can think about. And certainly, I think there's absolutely for sure no one solution. There's no magic wand, as I said. You know, what I've come to realize is that in this case, it is everybody's problem. And it's a problem for everybody to solve. Um, somebody said to me one time, you know, a settlement is not a settlement if there is a winner and there is a loser. It is only a settlement if both parties feel pain. So that's why I believe that in this situation, yes, of course, you can send a lot of people into liquidation, but if that doesn't really resolve the issue, other than you, um, you feel perhaps vindicated or satisfied that, that um, your life has been made so difficult by somebody and you put them into liquidation, but it doesn't solve your money issues. And therefore, I think that if we start thinking in this holistic manner, or we start adopting things like, um, accepting changes, compromises, looking at mediation to help us, then I like to think that you know, we, we will be able to get through this, uh, however difficult it may be. We've been, Malaysia has been through many, many um, difficult problems. I mentioned three recessions, but if you look at the world itself, I mean, our parents and grandparents have been through world wars. Uh, in Malaysia itself, they've been through the emergency, the confrontation. I, everyone seems to be, every time you, you're in one particular situation, I think you always think that this is um, the end of the world, so to speak. But it seems to me when looking out there, the world in Malaysia has just gone from strength to strength. People are very resilient. So I think people do, when they open up their hearts and their minds, can find solutions in a, in a moment of desperation. Thank you, Sweet. I can't agree more. Uh, that's all from me. I will now pass the mic to Wailun. Uh, Wailun, please. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you, uh, Swim and Hong Kit. Uh, first of all, I really personally uh, want to commend Swim for the um, uh, presentation. You know, uh, in these times, um, uh, difficult times, uh, we do need some calm voices, and you have done it for us, uh, Swim. And uh, from the presentation, uh, I can see that we get really, really good tips. Uh, it's a practical tips that it's not easy to pull together. You need a, lot, a person with a lot of experiences and uh, to share with us um, how to deal with these uh, difficult times. Um, well, uh, some of you might have uh, noticed for those who have followed us for the past nine days, uh, we both Hongkit and I were only wearing t-shirts, but today we have decided to wear a jacket uh, as we suspected uh, that the presentation today would be a gloomy one. You know, hopefully <laughs> by putting on a jacket, you know, uh, we'll be able to cheer myself up and also uh, perhaps uh, to the audience as well. Why not just got our dressing? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, also to congratulate us, we because uh, we have the highest number of audience uh, of the nine days. So we have hit at uh, the highest 620. Congratulations, uh, Suim. 
I yes, believe that the, you know, uh, very much that I want to, uh, it has got nothing to do with us wearing jackets today, definitely. <laughs> and uh, it has got to do with swimming, right? <laughs> now, uh, apart from the questions uh, posed by Hong Kit, I also have a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. Now, Suyin, you said that you have actually gone through and having, you know, really having seen uh, three recessions in Malaysia before this. Uh, how do you see uh, this panning out eventually? Well, look, if I had a crystal ball that worked, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here as an arbitrator, okay? I'll probably be on some uh, tropical island drinking my mojitos and thinking, uh, what the hell, man? But I don't have a crystal ball that, that, that works. And so I can only talk about what we've seen happen in the past and see how that can be projected into the future. We've seen that uh, every recession brings with it a lot of pain. There are a lot of store projects, there are a lot of bankruptcies, there are a lot of liquidations. But with that also comes a lot of restructuring, a lot of new thinking, and the resilience that people build. And they think in a different way, and they will reinvent themselves and find success again. Then, of course, that success gets to everybody's heads because we then get very relaxed and then something like this hits us yet again. And this is why we, we why there's so many recessions, why are there cycles? So I, I, I guess at the end of the day that um, we are going to see that. We are going to see that, that pain and that, that dip and the bankruptcies and the liquidations and the restructurings and what have you. But as I said, we have also seen people bounce back. We've seen economies and countries bounce back, get stronger, get better. So if you ask me, I think that's the way we're going to have to deal with this. Have faith and work hard and think about how we can solve this together as opposed to saying that I have a claim, you must pay me, you must save me. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, I... That is an excellent uh, uh, conclusion for the entire scenario now. Mm. Um, as, an, as an arbitrator and adjudicator yourself, uh, what advice uh, would you have for the participants today? Um, I repeat something I've said many times in all the talks that I've given, which is that as an arbitrator and adjudicator, we're dealing here with the contract and the law. We're not dealing with whether something is fair or not fair. The contract is a contract. As an arbitrator or adjudicator, if I don't make decisions in accordance with the contract, in accordance with the prevailing law, then my decision is no good. I know that a lot of people talk about the fact that their situation it is unfair upon them. And it, why is it that you know, it should be a fairer? But that may work in somewhere like a negotiation or mediation, but for an ar uh, arbitration or adjudication, I'm afraid it doesn't matter. Contracts are binding agreements, whether they're construction contracts, loan agreements, sale and purchase agreements, whatever. So if you don't actually settle those disputes, it goes to dispute resolution process, which is very, very much grounded on legal rights and obligations as set out in the contract. So what's set out in the contract often is also the risk allocation that I mentioned, which then may result in something which you feel is unfair. The other point about this is that, you know, in my years as a lawyer, a lot of people come into the office and talk about uh, how they have got such a great case. And then when you probe it a little bit further, yes, it may be a great case, but they can't prove it. There is no evidence, there's no documentation, there's not a way to prove it. And in fact, quite often, site meeting minutes will actually record something that is against what they have just been telling me about. So if you're going to go to dispute resolution process, these are the things you've got to think about, your contract and your documentation, your evidence, because it is a law-based uh, system. I see. How about uh, mediation? You see, you have actually uh, mentioned a few times about uh, mediation as the preferred mode of uh, resolution of disputes. Um, now, uh, despite many uh, pushes in the past, uh, efforts to push the uh, 
uh, mediation in Malaysia in the past, but it has not uh, been very successful. It has great, gained some traction this year, uh, recent years, but uh, it is still not considered to be a widely used uh, dispute resolution process. Uh, what, what do you have to say about this? Well, Lun, didn't I tell you I'm the Secretary of the Union of Unemployed Construction Mediators? <laughs> in the late, in yeah. the late 90s, there was a big push towards mediation. You know, projects such as the Hong Kong International Airport basically were res all the disputes resolved by way of mediation. So there was a big push here and I was part of uh, a, a large cohort of people uh, construction people who were trained uh, and accredited as mediators under a CIDB program and mediation clauses were um, included in a lot of standard form contracts but a lot of disputants did not embrace it and a lot of disputants seem to think that if I can settle it I'll settle it myself if I am going to engage a third party then I want that third party to tell him he's wrong and me that I'm right I don't want this wishy-washy in-between stuff. But, and I've also seen a lot of uh, mediations where parties come with uh, the total intention of stalling and not really uh, wanting to mediate. My point is this, at the end of the day, there are many disputes out there that are capable of mediation. They are capable of finding some middle ground. But if we don't want to find it, if we are not willing to open our minds and our hearts to it, then it cannot happen. But in a moment of crisis like this, then perhaps people's mindsets will change because um, traditional methods no longer work. And it may be that the successes of mediation in uh, other jurisdictions and in non-construction matters can be an inspiration. I have to say that uh, mediation, of course, uh, has, as you say, taken off to some degree. A lot of it actually due to the fact that they are caught in next mediations. And I've also heard a lot of stories whereby caught in next mediations work to some extent because people are afraid of the judges. But I've also heard and been involved with mediations whereby the mediators actually may have some form of formal training but can't do the work. So I think that we can actually use mediation much more, but it's something, again, that as a community, we actually have to embrace. The mediators have to be good at doing it. The, the lawyers and the consultants and the advisors need to understand what's all about, how to deal with it. And somebody must, and, and the disputants must come in willing to find a compromise. If previously you weren't, maybe today you are. So I, I do see this as perhaps one of the ways that we can used to try and um, mitigate the problems that no doubt we're all going to be facing. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Sui Yim. I have uh, got a question from uh, the audience. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think this is a uh, kind of a, a, a question that looks from a very ideal perspective. Uh, whether or not uh, it works in practice is another issue. Now, mm -hmm. the question is like this. Should the government intervene uh, to perhaps uh, force upon the contracting parties uh, a standard settlement policy um, and the uh, disputes should be worked within that standard policies uh, rather than leaving it to uh, the parties to resolve it uh, by themselves based on uh, their respective contracts. I think that it's, uh, <laughs> you ask me, I think it's an impossibility. I think that government policy can work to some extent. For example, government policy can be imposed on JKL contracts. I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, I've cited one particular FAQ uh, for the Ministry of Finance, whereby in respect of government procurement contracts, they have basically said that firstly, they must stop. And secondly, the stoppages are to be considered as force majeure. But uh, I mean, as we've said earlier on, that may mean time, but no money. I think that um, this, this is a question which is actually quite similar to questions that have been asked in the past with, with respect to standard form contracts. I mean, in, in year 2000, when we launched the CIDB 2000 contract, which was in those days considered a balanced contract, it's never been used because people think that it was contractor friendly. Uh, there was also questions about why don't we legislate for what to be the contract to be used. 
I, I don't think you can because I mean, what a, what a contract, contracts is about the freedom to contract, about the two uh, parties coming together to agree something that works for them. So in the case of settlements, I, I think that you can't also uh, impose something that uh, as a one, one solution for everybody. So I think that ultimately you're going to have to have um, a custom made solution for every settlement. And that can be, for example, a custom made solution that works at the main contract level, at the subcontract level, even uh, between your various, let's say, uh, domestic subcontractors or nominated subcontractors, each settlement may well be different. And when I yep. talk about settlement, I don't mean just giving, let's say, a massive discount, or I don't mean just giving, uh, walking away and, and accepting defeat. I mean, there are many ways of doing things. Uh, one, one of the things that um, I think would be very workable would be, for example, agreeing an amount that's owing and then working out a payment plan that is extended, as an example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Swim. Uh, actually, some uh, related to this issue, it actually lingers in my mind for some time. Now, assuming that you get a force majeure for an extension of time, right? A lot of people would uh, not be able to get the loss and expense because force majeure being a neutral event, it is not an employer's fault. Uh, therefore, uh, whatever uh, monies that the contractor expended, right, during this uh, delay period, uh, the, the, the loss uh, will have to be borne by the contractor. Yes. But if you see, if you look at it from a, a, a common sense perspective, right, this is an unusual uh, situation. Uh, uh, talking about pandemic of this scale, uh, this, type, this, this thing would or might only happen 100 years uh, once, right? Now, if it is really a neutral event, and if it is actually uh, not due to anybody's fault, shouldn't the cost reasonably incurred should be shared 50-50 between the employer and also the contractor. I mean, this is uh, from a very common sense perspective. I've uh, put away uh, all my legal, uh, 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 what is it, uh, thoughts, uh, uh, but this is something that perhaps uh, should be considered in this kind of a situation. And if the government can force upon this kind of a policy relating to compensation during this MTO period, right, uh, arising from a neutral event, I think it would uh, help a lot of people because we are talking about shared responsibility about and shared pain. And in the future, if we can survive and shared gain as well. Now, uh, this is just my thoughts. Uh, well, uh, this time around, uh, we have actually overrun for about uh, 15 minutes. Sorry about uh, that. If we can't, no, 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 it's not. Uh, I think the topic is just too interesting uh, for us. It's nothing that can really um, you know, prevent us from talking further. But uh, we have to keep to the time as much as possible. And there are still a lot of audience here, meaning to say that they're not complaining that we have overrun the session. <laughs> I'm sure they, they like your voice, Swim. <laughs> and uh, 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 before we end the session, Swim, do you have any concluding remarks for the audience? Yeah, everybody, you know, these are extraordinary times and extraordinary times calls for extraordinary measures. But it also calls for res resilience. It calls for the openness to what's changed and the ability to think about um, more novel ways of actually dealing with old issues. Uh, I don't think that there's any one solution. I certainly don't really offer you uh, any form of magic wand or sprinkling of stardust, but I do believe that in closing, we are all very resilient and the survival instinct is very strong. So let's work together as a community. It's everybody's problem and everybody's problem to solve together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Sreen, uh, for taking time to share with us uh, her valuable thoughts and experience. I think the key takeaway today is that uh, we all must have consideration for the community and also the ecosystem in this state of confusion and uncertainty. We must be slow and cautious not to jump the gun in initiating legal actions. So stay focused, uh, plan and channel our resources to reinvent, re-establish and re-energize ourselves rather than fighting a war without winners. Uh, thank you again, Sri, for sharing her thoughts. Now, uh, what if the MCO doesn't end? Our special guest tomorrow, Hon Ling, will lead us the way to weather the storm. So uh, please continue uh, to leave us questions and we will address them during our Q&A only section on the 13th. 
uh, great session today with a record turnout. Uh, thank you. Your continued support is very, very important uh, to us. Okay, see you tomorrow. Uh, bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye everybody. Thanks, Hongkit, and thanks uh, to all the. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Wylan. Thanks, Yuyin. Okay, bye. Thanks, L2.